We are back, and you're listening to The Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. The Global Times reports Biden's remarks on, quote-unquote, intervening militarily in Taiwan question, not GAF, but signals hollowing out one China policy. By stating the U.S. would intervene militarily in the Chinese mainland takes the island of Taiwan, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Three, two, one. By stating the U.S. would intervene militarily if the Chinese mainland takes the island of Taiwan by force, the Biden administration is taking a step further to hollow out the one China policy. And Biden's remarks led to China's strong opposition. What are we to make of this? Well, for insight, let's turn to our next guest. He holds the John J. and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book, his forthcoming book, is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas, Slavery, and Jim Crow, and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So President Biden was asked if the United States would defend Taiwan militarily if it is attacked by China. Biden said, yes, that's the commitment we made. We agree with the one China policy, but the idea that it can be just taken by force is just not appropriate. It would dislocate the entire region and be another action similar to what happened in Ukraine. And so it's a burden that's even stronger. There are, to me, Dr. Horn, a number of problems with that statement. It's incredibly incoherent, I think. It's inconsistent, and it's historically inaccurate. China has never said they're going to invade Taiwan. How can you say you agree with the one China policy, then you say we're going to invade China if they invade Taiwan? And when you compare this to the Ukraine, the United States fomented the Ukraine problem, to be kind. So he's throwing in a lot of stuff in the soup that doesn't make sense. Dr. Horn. Well, I think that Mr. Biden needs to be looked at not necessarily as a gas machine. That is to say that he puts his foot in his mouth, which he certainly does. But I don't see these recent provocative statements as gas. Not only the statement the other day with regard to China, but the earlier statement fundamentally calling for regime change in Moscow. I think a better lens through which to view uh, Mr. Biden is either through the lens we used to see Mr. Nixon, his predecessor in the 1970s. That is to say that recall during the Vietnam War, uh, Mr. Nixon said he wanted to be looked at as a crazy man when it came to confronting Vietnam, uh, that that would keep them off kilter and off balance. I think that intentionally or not, and I would hate to think that the chief executive of the United States is literally a crazy man. That's too uh, ghoulish to contemplate. So I would prefer to think that he's mimicking Nixon, that he would like to think that uh, he would like U.S. so-called adversaries to think that he's crazy. Because certainly it comes across that way when you move from the policy as articulated for decades of strategic ambiguity uh, leaving wiggle room for Washington to what can only be called strategic confusion, uh, which in some ways can be seen as much more unsettling. And I take it that Mr. Biden took note of the fact that during his trip to Northeast Asia, uh, Russia and China, rather unusually, had a joint military ex- exercise involving bombers over that uh, same territory, that is to say in the vicinity. Uh, This was a welcome of sorts, it seems to me, to the Quad meeting that was taking place in Tokyo today, the Quad being United States, Japan, Australia, and India, which is a sort of neo-Cold War framework uh, targeting uh, Beijing. But Mr. Biden must recognize that the Quad is fraying at the seams. The Japanese prime minister did not endorse his uh, strategic confusion with regard to 
uh, Taiwan or a purported Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, after all, uh, Taiwan sits only 65 miles from a populated Japanese island. And even though Japan is trying to raise its defense budget, I don't think it's any position as of yet to confront China, uh, even in league with U.S. imperialism. And then you know that this past Saturday you had a change of government in Australia. The hawkish Tory Scott Morrison replaced with the more dovish uh, Al- Anthony Albanese of the Labor Party, who brought along with him to Tokyo uh, his foreign minister, uh, Penny Wong, uh, who happens to be of Chinese ancestry and is much more dovish towards uh, China. Uh, than her predecessor. And I think it's also fair to say that uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences, which, as you know, for decades now has maintained this plot with a kind of countdown, ghoulishly enough, to nuclear holocaust, uh, with midnight being the witching hour, probably moved the hands a bit closer to the witching hour in light of Mr. Biden's provocative comments The only benefit that I can see is that, uh, as you know, uh, I, among others, has been complaining that many of our friends on the left uh, who have fundamentally endorsed the NATO position have looked at the Ukraine with a kind of tunnel vision from Washington to Kiev and Moscow, ignoring the global consequences, particularly the consequences now enunciated by Mr. Biden clearly that Ukraine is only stage one and Taiwan is stage two. And I think that Mr. Biden's comment will force many of our friends on the left to finally confront the bitter reality that the United States, uh, which spends more on the military than most other countries on planet Earth combined, apparently has decided that it cannot compete industrially It cannot compete technologically and reference here the fact that China's just rolled out a new aircraft that will challenge Boeing and Airbus. And so the United States has to compete militarily or try to triumph militarily. And that is dangerous for all humankind. Let me ask you this. I'll throw a couple other things at you. Number one, could it be as simple as a reality that Joe Biden, that they all sat around in the room and they all said, okay, we're not going to come out and say X, which is that we're going to militarily defend Taiwan and that Joe Biden now is not capable of retaining that information long enough to, (laughs) you know, reiterate it at the appropriate time, which I think is a possibility. And the other part I'll throw, which is maybe possible, is this. Sometimes when a person's taking a beating, they got to act tough. Recently, the Solomon Islands, the U.S., you know, threatened the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands said, nope, we're not. We're going to have this Chinese base in China. The Philippines, um, the Marcos has returned. And although he may not exactly be the second coming of FDR, Marcos is has said, I want a good, you know, I want to move towards China and away from confrontation. We're now seeing um, the same thing that happened in Australia, which would imply that at least that the Australian people want to move away from this thing that's tearing their economy to shreds. Could it be possible that either of those things, you know, they're taking so many losses right now, they want to act tough, or that Biden just couldn't remember what the heck he was supposed to say and blurted off something stupid out of, out of his mouth? One thing quickly before you respond, Dr. Horn, Garland, if you are right, and in your questioning Joe Biden's mental capacity, it's even worse than you are inferring because he was reading from a script. It, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Horn. Well, let, let, let's call that latter point uh, Garland Nixon's corollary on the crazy man thesis. That is to say, uh, our eminent uh, co-host here is suggesting that Mr. Biden literally might be crazy. And uh, I think that that's too frightening to contemplate. But what we do need to contemplate is this idea that Mr. Biden is committing gaffes when he speaks uh, out of turn. That is to say that I can commit a gaffe when it comes to articulating U.S. foreign policy. You can commit a gaffe. But Mr. Biden 
is the chief, chief executive officer, he states policy. And no amount, um, amount of spin or kind of cover-up by the staff can dilute that reality. Now, with regard to the Philippines, and I, I would point you to the disappointing meeting held by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations uh, who huddled in Washington at the White House just a few days ago. What's interesting is that there were no bilateral meetings with all of these heads of states and heads of government who showed up in Washington. Uh, Mr. Biden only met with them a little more than an hour or two. And so it's quite insulting. And then on top of it, the aid offered was peanuts, $150 million, compared uh, compared to the billions offered by the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So what we see is a U.S. foreign policy that's coming apart at the seams, and perhaps uh, Mr. Biden is in the position of heading a basketball team that's subjected to a full-court press, and in return, they can't handle the pressure and are having a collective nervous breakdown. China drums up support for global security push in Latin America as U.S. looks to Asia. China's foreign minister went on the global offensive in Latin America, promoting his country's proposed global security initiative in the U.S.'s backyard as Washington sought to shore up ties with Asia. Let me ask, quickly get your take on that, uh, Dr. Horn, particularly in the context of all the pushback now that Biden's getting from countries in the global south to the to the summit that's supposed to take place in Los Angeles as Biden has been excluding countries that he does not like. Well, you're right on the money. Obviously, this summit in Los Angeles organized by Washington, once again, is coming apart at the seams. You've seen the baby steps towards Mr. Biden normalizing relationships with Cuba, going back to the Obama policy, you see the half-hearted attempt to lift sanctions against Venezuela, which presumably will drive more oil into the U.S. market. But that's going to get severe pushback from Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey, a Democrat. And so I'm not sure how far that will go. Uh, Once again, it seems that Washington's foreign policy is uh, going nowhere fast. What what I was going to ask you is this. Um, It seems to me that basically China is saying if you're going to come to our neighborhood and push us around, we're going to come to your neighborhood and we're going to push up against the Monroe Doctrine. How far, you know, what is the U.S. in in the past would be, you know, raising cane and they'd be ready to go to war if someone was talking about a security pact in their in their in their neighborhood. It seems conspicuous that China is saying we're going to have a security pact of some type in Latin America and that the uh, Biden administration is conspicuously quiet about it. Well, China is not the only headache that U.S. imperialism may be enduring. People should pay careful and close attention to the glimmerings and the outlines of what we're about to witness, which is that Mexico, the largest Spanish-speaking nation on planet Earth, increasingly is crossing swords with U.S. imperialism. That's the import of the president of Mexico's triumphal trip to Cuba just a few days ago, of his threatening not to attend the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles if Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela are uninvited. And then Washington may even have to confront the specter of Haiti, oftentimes dubbed the poorest nation in the hemisphere, joining the African Union. And we are already in conversation with the Haitians about using that perch to launch human rights investigations of the United States focused on police terror and racist terror against black people in particular in light of this horrific Buffalo massacre, the headaches for U.S. imperialism proliferate. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you. Folks, you're listening to The Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon. I'm joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. There's more on the other side. Stay tuned. 